Welcome back. Richard, it's it's good to see you this morning after after we took a week off. That's right. July. We had a little time off in July. Yes. Um, uh, yeah. You finally we, got to see Chelsea up close and personal. I, I did. We 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 took uh we took weeks off. You you took a week off and then I took a week off and um traveled a little bit um for before the end of the school year, before the end of the summer and the start of the school year, because so you make it sound like we had a week off. We didn't have a week off. We took part of a week off. That's right. <laughs> we did. I would love to have a week off, but no, yeah. we took part of a week off. Right, right. But um, but it was it was it was good to get away for a little for a little bit, and now we're getting getting back at it. And as I said, the school system uh, is is opening up. The schools are about to welcome students um, back to for the for the new school year and. So we're going to start this off with um, a talk about oppositional defiant disorder. Right. Um, teachers Very have already come back, right? Um, yes, teacher, teachers. In our already... county, at least, teachers just went back. Um, right. School starts next week? Yes. Yeah. School starts well, next week. And when mm -hmm. I was out last week, I was in Georgia, and jo some of the Georgia schools started back last week. They this already started. Right. came back last week, yeah. Yeah, but um, this this is one of our rituals here, is that yep. every August or September, um, here we go again. Parents are um, always glad to see summer vacation roll in because they can take a breather, but they are also pretty glad when it comes to a close because they're ready to get back on some sort of a schedule. Absolutely. So here we are. And we're going to talk about ODD today. We've talked about this in a couple of previous podcasts, but there's some additional information that we wanted to add. And it's also an appropriate topic with the beginning of school because there are children unfortunately, who have uh, what what may be ODD, what looks like ODD, who will be returning to school in a couple of, uh, in a week or so. And so um, we thought it would be an appropriate time to flesh out this topic of ODD, because it is a topic that is especially germane to children. Uh, if you're a parent or a teacher, um, ODD is one of those things that appears fairly early in life, certainly before uh, the end of elementary school. So, um, it is a, a disorder of childhood. Yeah. And we thought an appropriate time to talk about that. Uh, absolutely. And, you know, so with oppositional defiant disorder, and we've, we've mentioned on the podcast before that, that we're not, we're not necessarily huge fans of the, this diagnosis because um, historically, at least it, it, there's certain several implications or several assumptions that are made when it comes to this diagnosis. But as you mentioned, there's some new information that kind of maybe will make us think of, lead to some different thoughts about this diagnosis, at least the way in the way in which it's you know related to some biology or neurobiology. Right. Um, but but when it comes to the, this the diagnosis of oppositional defiant disorder we're talking about as you said it, it starts earlier in life but this is something that extends beyond you know things like the terrible twos um you know it, it's not something that's just a, a, an occasional tantrum or maybe even a frequent tantrum that, that you see when with two-year-olds or three-year-olds when they want something and they're not allowed to get it or something. Um, but these are the frequent and ongoing and continue into multiple settings over over an extended period of time. You know, so this right. is far beyond just when a, a child is just two or three years old. This goes into, uh, again, as you said, into elementary school and, and sometimes even beyond that. Right. Yeah. One of the reasons we we struggle with this diagnosis is this is one of those things that is frequently very hard to tell whether 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 the child is misbehaving enough to make the diagnosis because all kids will be a little oppositional on occasion you know it starts we are all familiar with the terrible twos and threes but all kids will be oppositional and defiant on occasion so how do you know that we now are entering the world of of a diagnosis, of a psychiatric diagnosis. And so that takes some um, diagnostic skill to know because you don't you don't want to misdiagnose. Uh, you don't want to miss a diagnosis and you also don't want to misdiagnose a child who really doesn't have ODD. 
Right. I, I, absolutely. And and there is a, a bit of an overlap in, in the at least the topography of symptoms right. between ODD and like attention deficit yeah. activity disorder, ADHD. Oh. Um, for example, you know, with ADHD, we talk about symptoms like, you know, a child, you know, they'll they'll be unable to follow multiple step directions because they'll they'll forget or they'll get distracted and and so they'll they'll forget what you ask them to do or um, sometimes they're not paying enough attention and so they won't hear what you're asking them to do and so you may say the same thing over and over and over again and it takes a while for the child to oh that's what you want me to do and they finally attended long enough to, to hear um, and when that's attributed to ADHD we talk about it from the perspective of attention and focus and things like that but when we talk about that sort of same behavior, refusing to comply, notice how the words change. We, now we're talking about refusing to comply. Now we're talking about a, a, a volitional, uh, at least apparent, uh, apparently volitional uh, intent to not do what they're being asked to do. And right. so we're talking about the difference between, you know, not focusing and not paying attention sort of out of their control versus refusing you know i know what you asked me to do and i'm just not going to do it um, right. two very different ways of looking at the same behavior right. just very different different attributions that we're placing on on the purpose of and motivation behind the behavior right yeah when 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 we enter the world of oppositional defiant disorder there are four sort of classic symptoms that we need to look out for they are anger irritability um and irritability and arguing with you, being defiant, of course, but also being vindictive. So it's anger, irritability, arguing, defiance, and being vindictive. How do you know, how? what leads you to suspect, if you're a parent or a teacher, what should lead you to suspect that you're dealing with ODD? Well, one of the things that parents frequently say is, we all feel like we're walking on eggshells in the house. We're all worried of what's going to come next. So if you get that feeling that you're walking on eggshells, you're a little tentative, you're a little afraid of one of the kids, it might be more than just a, a little misbehavior. Um, if a child has started to take over the house, and by taking over the house, you suddenly find yourself, the entire family starts to revolve around one, one child. Right. It could be an only child, or you, it could be one of several. You might have three or four children. But it just seems like all of a sudden you realize that most of what we're doing as a family is revolving around the mood changes and the behavior of this one child. And the third symptom is that there, this child typically has very serious problems with relationships, with making and keeping friends. They have trouble with activities. They go to um, athletic activities, for example, and they have problems with the other kids and problems with coaches. And the other thing is they have serious problems in school. So these kids really make themselves known to us in three uh, significant ways. So the eggshells, they take over a house, and they have serious problems. So when we talk about anger, so when we talk about these major symptoms, anger and irritability, these are kids who lose their temper quickly. They're easily annoyed and they're resentful, they, they, they wanna get revenge, um, and that's a problem. Arguing and, and defiance, um, they argue with adults. Most children will not argue with an adult. These kids will, they will correct adults and argue with adults. Uh, they refuse to do things. And as you said earlier, it's not because they forget to do it, they just stand there and say, I'm not doing it. They will, they will take you, they'll go to the mat. Um, they annoy others on purpose. Um, I was with a relative recently, and one of them had a had a young boy, and he just tormented the daylights out of his sister. I mean, just it was almost unending, and he would just torment her endlessly. Um, and and he did it on purpose. He did it just to get a rise out of her. Mm -hmm. um, and they also blame others. Now, that's another thing that these kids never take responsibility for what they're doing. It's always somebody else's fault. Right. And then the revenge seeking, they, they will get revenge. Um, and that's another problem with, with these kids is they stay angry and they get revenge if they feel that they've been slighted. Absolutely. And, and, and there, there are various severity levels, depending on how, in how many settings they, it occurs and, and mm -hmm. just the pervasiveness of it. But, you know, as we as we hear these these symptoms, you know, 
it does require a, a, a knowledgeable and skilled clinician to make the diagnosis. I know that many parents are going to hear as you go through those symptoms and be, oh my gosh, that's my kid. Oh my gosh, that's my kid. Um, you know, most kids, most kids will do some of these things sometimes, um, but to really think about it as a disorder, it requires some other teasing apart of things because you know, we could sit here and talk about, again, ADHD, and we could talk about some of those same types of behaviors, um, some of them at least. We could talk about a diagnosis called disruptive mood dysregulation disorder and talk about some of these same exact characteristics and symptoms. Um, and we could talk about a kid who grows up in a home where he's sort of overly indulged. Um, he's allowed to have whatever he wants. He's allowed to do whatever he wants. And then the parents try to create some boundaries. And all of a sudden, this kid is pushing back like crazy and can, again, present with a lot of these same behaviors and characteristics. So you, you have to tease apart a lot of this stuff because if you, you know, we want to make the correct diagnosis, but when we're talking about a child who who genuinely has oppositional defiant disorder, um, these symptoms are present even when you're doing many of the things that you should be doing. You're 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 covering your bases as it relates to you know diagnostic things, but also um, your parenting strategies and your your approach to managing the behavior. These behaviors oftentimes will still persist even when you do some of the the basic things that the parents, you know, that we would want parents to be doing when managing behavior. Right. Yeah. They'll say this child is different, you know, yeah. the, the, and, and you, you can recognize it. Um, as far as severity is concerned, and, and this is another good, um, I think a good metric to keep in mind. If you have mild ODD, you see these behaviors in one setting maybe just at home. Um, I had a child, the, uh, I didn't have a child, I heard about a child the other day, um, lives near some family members and only has problems at school. He's fine at home, he's fine in all the athletic teams, but he only has trouble in school. So we call that mild. Moderate is in two settings and severe is in three or, or more than two settings. In other words, it's, it's pervasive, it occurs everywhere. Um, so keep that in mind. Now there are a couple of other things to keep in mind, and I find this one particularly interesting. 67% of children who get this diagnosis no longer have symptoms within three, within three years of the diagnosis. So you have a kindergarten kid who appears to have ODD, but by the time he's in school for a couple of years and he gets properly socialized, suddenly the symptoms start to disappear in about 67% of cases. About the, the remaining 30%, unfortunately, can go on to have something called conduct disorder, which is major rule breaking, especially breaking laws and rules that get them into serious trouble. Yeah. And then the and then third, the, the third thing is what you've already mentioned, that the symptoms we see in children with ODD exist in several other disorders that we see in children. Um, and so we have to be careful in making this diagnosis. Um, there are lots of reasons to be careful. One is that these behaviors are also normal. They, they're, they're expressed normally by children, um, not as pervasive. And also it can look like other things. It can look like anxiety. It can look like obsessive compulsive disorder, mild autism. So there's a lot of symptom overlap that we need to be aware of, and we need to build that into our diagnostic decision-making. Uh, absolutely. So, so when we're thinking about parenting, especially parenting kids with oppositional mm -hmm. defiant disorder, some of these characteristics, um, we, we included in the, in the show notes a, a link to an article from Child Fine, um, or Child Mind Institute yeah. um, mm -hmm. about oppositional defiant disorder. And I, I really like this quote from, from one of the... Um, Dr. Dr. Anderson, he, the quote is, uh, kids who have behavioral issues push parents towards the extremes. And, and it's so true. And we've seen, we see this very often in our, um, our own office, when we see parents who have children with really challenging behaviors, you know, suddenly these parents who may have, maybe even had started out or with their other kids were very calm and gentle and, and patient and all that, suddenly you know, with with when a child has oppositional defiant disorder, suddenly the parents become short tempered and ex almost explosive themselves, um, right. and and it's they they 
get to these extremes uh, mm -hmm. for discipline and for responding to their children. Um, and, and they have a hard time sometimes wrangling it back in. Right. Yeah, the, it's a challenge. And and you have parents who just say, we just want to keep the lid on the house. You know, we I've already repaired three holes in, in our walls, you know, in his bedroom. And so there's a little bit of there's a little bit of timidity and maybe even some fear with these children. So you don't want to upset them. So you become a little too permissive. On the other hand, some parents become authoritarian right. and they want to clamp down and get controls. They do, and I agree with you, it's a it's a really a good quote. They drive you to the extremes. Uh, those aren't going to work. You you can't exercise that kind of control in a normal household. You, you right. just neither, neither extreme works. The, the, right. the becoming, you know, completely hands off and, mm -hmm. and completely permissive, that's not going to work because that kid's going to take over. They're going to get worse. And right. it, you can't be, you know, authoritarian because, you know, now you're getting into a fight that you, you know, and I, parents hate it when I say this, I think, but it, you, you can't win that battle. Kids can say and do things that a parent can't say or do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, your kids can say, I hate you, but hopefully you would never say that you hate your kid. You know, <laughs> you wouldn't say the same thing to your kid. And so, right. you know, um, and you're not going to say that hurts my feelings and right. receive any sympathy from them. They're, you know, yeah, but you've said no to me. So right. I hate you. So right. it's not going to work. Yeah. But if you if you have a child who has this disorder, one of the things you're going to have to do, uh, the, where's the sweet spot in parenting? It's somewhere between those two extremes. Right. You have to mean what you say. Right. Uh, you can you can go to any mall, you can go to any school, um, a church, it doesn't matter where you go, and you will see parents say something to their children, and the child just runs off like they never heard anything. You know, right. It's time to leave, and the child just wanders off with his friends. If you don't mean what you say, please don't say it. If you're not willing to go to the mat, if yeah. you're not willing to stop that child in his tracks, please don't say anything. Because if you say something and you're not willing to, to, to take whatever action it right. needs to make it happen, it's best just to stay silent until you are absolutely ready to back up what you're saying. Uh, absolutely. And that goes for that goes for other people being around. I, I worked with a, a family recently and, you know, the the child was um, being a bit oppositional, I will say. And um, the, the the another relative was around and the other relative starts to support the child and what the okay. child wants against what the parent is trying to get the, the kid to do. Right. Oh, my. You know, you know, talk about creating. A, a massive massive issue you, you know the parent you know the, this parent did a great job of doing what she needed to do to 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 get the child to comply but you know when when you have this other stuff happening it only makes things worse everybody has to be on the same page right um, you know when you say you have to mean what you say it can't be that mom means what she says but then you go ask dad and dad means what he says. That, but the problem is, is that mom and dad are saying two different things. Mm -hmm. it, right. That can't, that can't be the case. When when you say you mean what you say, that means that goes for everybody. Everybody's right. on the same page, all the parents, all the adults, everybody's on the same page. Right. Yeah. So if, if you say it, you have to mean it and you have to be willing to back it up and you've got to pay attention to what your child is doing when you make these verbal requests. Um, now we're we're about to enter. I feel like I'm I feel like I'm going out on a limb here or getting into thinner ice, but we're about to enter. A, a, it's not controversial, but it, it might be new information mm -hmm. um, when it comes to oppositional defiant disorder because there's an emerging part of this that you need to know about. Now, mm -hmm. this could be this this diagnosis could be. There's a biological component to it. Right. It's possible that that you, a, a parent, created oppositional defiant disorder in your children. That's always right. possible. Right. Just poor parenting, inconsistent parenting, busy parenting. Um, there's a, there's a dozen reasons. Yes, it's possible that you could have created uh, ODD in your child. Um, it's sometimes hard for a parent to tell, especially if you're a first time parent. If it's an only child. 
it's it's sometimes difficult to know that wow this child's behavior is really different um we, we frequently see parents and they say well i've raised three kids and this child is very different yeah. so you have that comparison yeah. uh, but if it's an only child or your first time parent uh, you may not recognize it right it's usually diagnosed in elementary school as we as we said which means you if, if you make these diagnoses early it, it might be of neurodevelopmental origin, uh, but a lot can happen between birth and three and birth and four right. to move a child in this direction. Um, many, some preschoolers, and we're talking about kids who are two and three, begin to show these signs. There are lots of kids. Bernie, how many kids have you seen who've gotten expelled from preschool? Right. Getting expelled from daycare. They get kicked out. Yeah. Right. They get kicked out of daycare. Yeah, so I would say if your child getting kicked out of kindergarten or kicked out of daycare or preschool, it's probably a pretty serious issue that should be addressed. Yeah. Now, having stated that, there is a research that says there are brain differences in children who have this diagnosis, and right. and I think that's a that's really an important um, finding. It's an important right. statement. Okay. Uh, there's really three or four things that that we should talk about. One is these children have low punishment sensitivity, and most parents who deal with these kids know that that they don't they don't really they'll come in and they'll tell you no matter what we do it doesn't work. Okay, absolutely. They, the 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 children are not they're just not afraid. And, yeah, exactly. And that is oftentimes associated with lower levels of like serotonin and noradrenaline in, in the system, um, but you know, when we when we experience stress, when any of us experience stress, we we have you know this this burst of like cortisol and adrenaline in our in our system. But for some reason, it seems as though there's this pattern uh, of children who authentically have this diagnosis, where th they have reduced adrenaline, they have re reduced um, release of of cortisol uh, during stress, or their bodies don't don't react to it in the same way, right. and, and certain regions of their brain just doesn't seem to have the same level of activity that um that that you know suggests that the child is responding um in the way that we would expect them to respond and so parents will talk about you know i could be getting onto him i could be yelling at him i could be telling him these different punishments and he just sits there and looks at me <laughs> right. he doesn't even react there's no there's no affect on his face at all to suggest that he is concerned or worried or afraid or anything about any potential consequence. And again, this kind of goes to and suggests some neurobiological, neurochemical um, differences in kids with this disorder. That's right. And so that that's what's happening. If you, when parents say nothing works, you know, it doesn't matter how loud I get, it doesn't matter if I spank him and nothing seems to matter. That's correct. These children have low punishment sensitivity because of differences in their brain chemistry and differences in the way certain brain structures react to what these kids are hearing and seeing. Right. So that's one problem. Second problem is there's a reduced sensitivity to reward. With people who have addiction, they have an increased sensitivity to reward. So th those are addicts, okay? Because a little bit of alcohol, a little bit of cocaine, a little bit of anything, and their brain becomes very active and they want more. These children are just the opposite. They have a reduced sensitivity to reward. We know that children with opposition defiant disorder have a lower basal heart rate. They just, it takes more to stimulate them than, than others. They, they need, they look for excitement. They look for activity. They look for stimulation. Also, the dopamine, you all know about dopamine and how it's the reward system. They have altered do dopamine. And so reward just doesn't mean that much to them. So when parents say, it doesn't matter whether I reward him or punish him, nothing seems to work. You're absolutely right, because these children have lower dopamine and or, or they have altered dopamine and they just don't respond to rewards the way other children do. Right. So these kids need more stimulation just to get to normal. And that's what I explained to teachers that they're looking for. They're looking to do things 
that bring them up to a normal uh, normal resting state. Right? Absolutely. And we used to, I, I remember, you know, back in the, in the day, you and I, you know, years ago, we would talk about some of these kids that with obsession with defined disorder, that if you if you had them on, on the couch talking with them or something, and if they sat there long enough, it, it was almost like they would just go to sleep. Right. Because right. it was like that, again, that sort of lower basal heart rate, they, they, they have lower, um, everything is at a, at a, at a lower pace in, right. in their, you know, neurochemistry. And it was almost like they had to keep things pushed. They had to keep pushing things just to keep that arousal, that neurological arousal going. Right. Um, th but the, the interesting sort of counter to that is that when you think about their executive function system, the, the system that helps regulate emotions and behaviors and some of those things, that their, their executive function system, like kids with ADHD, is, is impaired. And so it doesn't control some of those emotions and behaviors as well as you would want it to. So right. mm -hmm. they, they start to get worked up. And once that train gets going, it is really difficult for them to rein it back in and mm -hmm. to, to bring it back under control. And so then they lose control and we know what, what we experience at that point. And then they have to work through all of that before they can re regain some, you know, some semblance of control. That's right. But, but you see these kids looking for trouble. Well, they're not and that's what that's what frequently we hear is that well they're, he's always looking for trouble he's always he's always mess always doing things we don't want him to do it it may not be that they're looking for trouble it may be that they're looking for stimulation right and they get it by teasing others and they get it by being physical and they get it by being loud they they stimulate themselves to bring themselves up to a normal arousal level that most of us don't have to do so it may be that they're seeking stimulation that they're not really just misbehaving. They're, they're not doing this just to be defiant or oppositional. They're doing it to, because they're seeking stimulation. Right, and oh. there's some and, and there's some functional MRI um, data right. to, to, that supports a lot of this. But you know what we would encourage parents to think about is this idea that you know if you have a kid with that sort of neuro mm. neurological um, experience, that was that's what's happening up, upstairs. And then you combine that with a parent who responds in a way that's either one of those extremes that we talked about earlier, mm -hmm. you can see how this perpetuates a problem, how the problem just can get worse and worse and worse mm -hmm. to the point that, you know, you, you have a kid who maybe has some of that neurological under arousal that we were talking mm -hmm. about. And so they're seeking stimulation. And so they, they do something. And when they do that, it, elicits a response from the parent. Um, sometimes that response can be very um, aggressive and sometimes that response can be very permissive. Mm -hmm. And when it's very permissive, especially, then what that child will learn, if we go back to our behavioralism uh, roots, um, what that child then learns is, man, if I, push, if I push a little bit further like that, I get this reward, I get this thing that I want. And so they're going to continue to do that. And this is how the behavior continues to, to escalate mm -hmm. over time. And, and it's really um, it's really difficult for parents to kind of get back to, you know, get back under control th those situations. Um, because once you've once you've started on that path again, the kid is going to keep looking for that path. They're going to keep pushing things to try to get that same result. Right. And if you, you think about it, you know, here's a here's a little kid, four or five, six years old, and he doesn't know this, of course, but he's saying, I need more stimulation than anybody in the room. So right. I'm going to act out more than anybody in the room. I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a correlation between those two things. And the child is not doing it, may not be doing it on purpose. This feels purposeful. It feels like they're doing it on purpose. But it may be that they're just trying to stimulate themselves. The research, the brain research, suggests that they are just trying to stimulate themselves, get themselves up to some normal level. Which, which also may be why a lot of these kids really prefer things like aggressive video games or um, you know very active video games and, and very active right. sports and things like that because it it just stimulates so much of that. And so again, you, you may be fighting biology here and, and there, there's a, some evidence emerging now to suggest that neurodevelopmental, neurobiological um, underpinnings. Um, 
but but also again remember that parents we we make a lot of mistakes um during those early years and if we're not careful we can set the stage for what mm-hmm. may um may develop over time and so again teasing apart what is truly biological or truly diagnostic versus right. what is learned behavior based upon the way in which the child and parent interactions happen during those early years. Yeah. Yeah. This fMRI study was really interesting. They they came out with two, I think, informative conclusions. One was that youth with, with disruptive behavior disorders like ADHD and ODD, they have dysfunction in brain structures that mediate the reward system okay that there's something amiss in the reward they 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 uh don't respond to rewards as as we would expect them to um youth with psychopathic traits and these would probably be the children who go on to have conduct disorder um they have dysfunction in structures that mediate their emotions, and especially empathy uh, right. for other people. And so we know that these structures are associated with these behaviors. And so the fMRI studies make these two, I think, very helpful uh, decisions, that it could be the reward system, but it might be the emotional uh, and empathy system. Absolutely. So keep in mind that when you have a child who takes over the house, who makes everybody walk on eggshells, who's a constant problem, is kicked out of daycare, kicked out of school, we might be fighting biology, okay? And so if these symptoms appear very early, it's probably a neurodevelopmental issue. I mean, you can make a lot of mistakes between, a lot of parenting mistakes between birth and three. It's We are all capable of spoiling a child in the first three or four years of life. But if you have a child who who really begins to take over, who is really a challenge, um, as we say with ODD, it's intense and it's it's prolonged. Um, it may be that you're fighting biology, and 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 so you may you may need to get help, um, because if it's not behavioral, if you've ruled out and you've tried everything and they don't respond to rewards and punishment, it might be biological. But I think extreme behavior, and these kids have extreme behavior, requires extreme parenting. And it, and it takes, regardless of whether it's biology or behavior, it takes uh, persistent parenting to get this right. It, it, it's a huge challenge. Yeah, absolutely. So, all right. Well, we will certainly be talking more about this topic um, over over time because, uh, well, again, the school use system is uh, opening back up. Schools are about to welcome students back. And um, so we'll be dealing with the behavior uh, some more very, very soon. So mm-hmm. that is it for today. Until next time, stay happy, stay healthy, and forget to be afraid. <laughs>